Alors, Creation Myth Part 2. This is our Voie Lactée. And this is where we are here in our solar system. <laughs> Very humbling, to say the least. So we're going to start off to Africa. And we're going to go with the Bushmen. Now, I have the privilege of living nine years in South Africa. And I uh, met some Bushmen. They live in little tribes of 20, 25, no more. They're nomadic, and they live in the desert. The sea has no part in it. The Kahalari Desert, Southern Africa, and also in Namibia. Deserts. <coughs> A totally classless, egalitarian society. No gender power whatsoever. Rare nowadays. They live in Southern Africa, and some experts say there is evidence that they are one of the oldest human cultures in the world. Archaeologists can record the history up to 20,000 years, and they have no name for themselves. They call themselves the people. Today, there are less than 100,000 Bushmen remaining, and they live the same way as 20 thousand years ago. In the Bushman creation story, people and animals lived together peacefully underneath the earth with Kang, the great master and lord of all life. And we're going to see throughout those creation stories that there is always a great chief or a great spirit that is, we call, I mean, with our monotheistic uh, arrogance, we call the so-called primitive cultures polytheistic, pagan, no. There's always a supreme being. So Khan is the great master and lord of all life. And in those days, people and animals could understand one another. During this time of bliss, Khan began to plan the wonders he would put in the world above, because they were living underneath the earth. And he created a magic, wondrous tree with branches stretching over the entire country. At the base of the tree, he dug a hole that reached all the way down where the people and animals lived. And here is a modern day representation of the roots of the tree that go way down. Then, Kang <coughs> met the first man up the hole. We sat down on the edge of the hole, and soon the first woman came up out also, and soon all the people were gathered at the foot of the tree, awed by the world they had just entered. Next, Kong began helping the animals climb out of the hole. In their eagerness, some of the animals found a way to climb through the tree's roots and some come out of the branches. <laughs> they continued racing up to the world beneath, off the world beneath mm -hmm. until all the animals were out. Khan gathered all the people and animals about him. He instructed them to live together peacefully. Then he turned to the men and women and warned them not to build any fires or a great Everything would befall them. They gave their word. And Khan left to where he could watch his world secretly. As evening approached, the sun began to sink beneath the horizon. And the people and animals stood watching this phenomenon. But when the sun disappeared, fear entered the hearts of the people. In desperation, one man suggested that they build a fire to keep warm. Forgetting Kang's warning, they disobeyed him. They soon grew warm and were once again able to see each other. But the fire frightened the animals. They fled to the caves, they fled to the mountains, and ever since the people broke Kang's command, people have not been able to communicate with animals. Fear had replaced the friendship once held in between the two groups. The Bushmen 
believe that not only are plants and animals alive, but also rain, thunder, the wind, springs. It's called animism. <coughs> they claim what we see is only the outside form or body. Inside is a living spirit that we cannot see. These spirits can fly out of one body into another. For example, a woman's spirit might sometimes fly into a leopard, leopard, leopard. <laughs> or a man's spirit fly into a lion's body, like reincarnation or soul migration in Buddhism and the Zohar. Hunting Bushmen with a cigarette. <laughs> Botswana Bushmen, this is where I saw them, and the famous Baobab tree. Now, we're going to leave the Bushmen and meet the Zulu. The Zulu are warriors. And here they are, their kingdom. A photo of them in the late 1800s. The Zulu people came into being as a nation when King Shaka created a militaristic Zulu kingdom in the early 19th century. And the Zulu creation myth was written during that time. The creator of human beings in traditional Zulu mythology was Unkulunkulu, <laughs> who created the first man and the first woman, like all the creation myths we witnessed last week. And it all began with reeds. <clears throat> and this is a ceremonial reed dance. Mm -hmm. Which also means ancestor in the Zulu language, Kwazulu Munguni, was the creator of all things. And he grew out of a reed. And when he became too heavy, oof, he fell to earth. Umvelin Kanki was the sky god who descended from heaven and married Uthlanga. He created the reeds which birthed. <laughs> and like Zeus, he shows himself to people as thunder and earthquakes. Uthlanga, also Ulanga, was a large mythical reed marsh in the north, again linking their creation myth to the environment in which they lived. And this is from there that the creation came into existence. Zululand in South Africa. They don't have an independence anymore. They are part, they've been colonized in South Africa. By the Indian Ocean in the Natal province. The story. Long before any man or animal were on earth, there was only darkness and one very large seed. The seed sank into the earth, and from the sea, long reeds grew. They were called Uthlanga, which means the source of all things. Slowly, one of the reeds grew into a man, and it was Unkulunkulu, the first man, and the creator of everything. Unkulunkulu <coughs> created humans and animals, mountains, rivers, lakes, he taught Zulu how to hunt, to make fire, and how to grow food. When he became full grown, he broke off from his reed and fell into the earth. And as he walked along the earth, he saw other men and women growing from the reeds. Unkulunkulu broke off other men and women from the reeds as he walked along. And medicine men and their dreams were also pulled off. <clears throat> he pulled off from all the reeds cattle and fish and fierce creatures. He also taught the Zulu people how to make clothes and prepare corn, which, by the way, came to Africa via Mexico through the Portuguese tradesmen. Mm. <laughs> and like Adam in the Bible, Unkulunkulu 
then give all the animals their names. Here is Umwaba, the mythical chameleon. He was sent by the sky god to tell the people and creatures of the earth that they had immortal life. But because Umwaba, he was too slow, so the people and creatures of earth did not become immortal after all. And chameleons turn from green to brown because they are sad that Umwaba was too slow. <laughs> Especially important in traditional Zulu mythology were the ancestors to watch over the people today, as well as creatures that were part human and part lizard. Now, those of you who were the last week, in the extraterrestrial myth from Sumer, we have the Anunnaki that were part human and part lizard. And also spirits were also thought to exist in animals in the forest and the cave. <coughs> the Zulu shaman Credo Mutva, here is with the color, and the color tells the story of his people. And the reptilian ETs came to earth and genetically engineered mankind. This is Intulo from the Zulu, a lizard-like creature with human characteristic. Now, you compare the Zulu Intulo to the Sumerian Anunnaki. Mm -hmm. Amadlosi were the Zulu ancestors, and people can appeal to the spirit world by invoking these ancestors. And Inkosrezana was the goddess of agriculture, a female spirit that makes the maize corn grow, and she's worshipped in the inner spring. And there is Malambo, the goddess of the rivers. And there is Mbaba Mwana Baresa, the goddess of rainbows, rain, crops, and cultivation. And she's also <laughs> beloved because she gave the gift of beer. Home brewed beer from a mixture of shogun, cornmeal, and yeast, very rich in vitamin B. The Zulu people call Umkulumkulu, also Umdali, the creator. And Umvelikandi, before everything. That links us back to last week, is Ilotambore, in the time before time. Still in Africa, we're going to meet the Maasai. It can be spelled M-A-A-S-A-I, or this way. The Maasai are cattle people. They're magnificent. They're very tall. And you find them in Kenya and Tanzania. Look at them. The Maasai jumping dance is called the Adani. It's a rising beat sweeping emotion in the <coughs> A universal rhythm a dance which celebrates the rite of passage, welcoming young men to the next stage of their lives. And Ankai is the Maasai creator of the world, and is created in the image of the Maasai. Using a tree, again, Ankai created the humans, he split the tree into three parts. One of the parts became the father of the Maasai and was given a stick for animal herding. That's a representation of Ankai. And this is the tree of life. From the other two parts of the tree, Ankai created the father of the Kikuyu and the father of Kamba, two other Maasai tribes. Kikuyu was given a hoe for agriculture and Kamba was given a bow and arrow for hunting. The one god of the Maasai, Ankai, is also known as Ngai. And Ngai has many facets, two of which are Ngai Narok, benevolent and good, whose color is black, and Ngai Na Nyokye, angry and evil, whose color is red. Ngai was one with earth, and he owned all the cattle. 
So one day, sky and earth split from each other, and it guy took all the cattle up into the sky. But the cattle needed to eat grass from the earth in order to survive. So Ngai decided to send the cattle back to the earth and asked the Maasai people to take care of the cattle. This is why the Maasai are the owners of all the cattle. Thanks to the Maasai creation myth, the Maasai tribe tries to help the neighboring tribes in their cattle. If a Maasai tries to do another activity beside the cattle, it is considered an insult to Ngai. Though the Maasai do not often eat the flesh of the cattle, they drink their milk mixed with blood. By puncturing with an arrow the loose flesh of the cow's neck, they never kill to drink the blood. They are blowing the kudu horn. A means to communicate between villages, but also sacred sounds for ceremony. And I couldn't resist the juxtaposition of the shofar with the kudu horn. In the Maasai tribes, circumcision happens at the age of 18 without anesthesia. <laughs> Boys who cry because of the pain are considered cowards and bear the shame all the life. Boys who don't cry during circumcision are authorized to hunt birds with a bow and arrows and then they make a headdress indicating their warrior status. Now we're going to leave <coughs> Africa and we're going to go to Australia to meet the Aboriginal creation myth and their dreamings. The Aborigines can be traced back to 40,000 BCE, before the cover era. The Aborigines of Australia are considered one of the oldest surviving cultures in the world. Different creation stories exist among the different Aboriginal groups. And these dream time stories are a place where everybody exists forever. <clears throat> According to the Aboriginals, the dreaming era preceded our own, an era when spirit beings formed creation. It is believed that a culture of heroes or gods traveled across a land without form and created sacred sites giving <coughs> language to people. Painting a dreaming is a trance-like journey. Here's a lizard dreaming. You have to understand that the human world is linked to the physical world who is linked to the sacred world, who goes back to the human world. There cannot be a fullness of being a human without the spiritual linked to the physical. The physical, the material, without the spirit, we are doomed. We need the spiritual. And music helps reaching the state of dreaming, to connect with the ancestors. And they have the digeludu, was developed a thousand five hundred years ago in Northern Australia. And the dark land was called Il Patlingja. It had nothing save an endlessly tall pole called the Tnatlingja. The pole stretched right to the top of the heavens and it arose from the head of Karora who was laying in the thick night asleep, while all around him was deep darkness, blackness. Karora, a very lonely god that dreams up living creatures so he wouldn't be alone anymore. The creator god according to the Bandicoot clan. Bandicoot? What's Bandicoot? <coughs> Karora's dreams 
were as bright and colorful as the world we know today. And he was dreaming of the bandicoot. Look at this. Bandicoot <laughs> comes from bandicoku, which means pig rat. And the bandicoots were coming out of Carora's navel, armpits, nose, and mouth. So we can love what we want, but in the Genesis, if it's coming from a rib of the side, with the <laughs> rib, no, the, uh, <laughs> suddenly, dawn arose, arose, yes, arose, <coughs> and impacting Jack was flooded with light for the first time. Carora rose from where he had been sleeping, and he had been sleeping for a long, long time, and he was tired, and he was hungry. So he grabbed two bandicoots, cooked them in the pots. His hunger sated, Carola lay down to sleep again. And he dreamed of a bull roar, which emerged from the armpit. What's a bull roar? It's an ancient ritual musical instrument and a device historically used for communicating over greatly extended distance. It dates to the Paleolithic period. And very weird enough, it was also found in Ukraine. Yeah. So the link here between uh, Australia and Ukraine and the Bull Roar, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the Bull Roar took on a human form and grew into a young man. And when Carora woke, his son was dancing around him. It was the very first ceremony. Dance. Dance is sacred. By day, father and son hunted for petticoats. And by night, as they slept, the father, Kamura, dreamt of more and more songs. To find each morning, as he woke up, twice as many as the night before. By day, Carora and all of his sons hunted and ate bandicoots. And it was not long before the land rat ran out of bandicoots. <laughs> so Carora sent his sons further and further away to hunt. And they returned hungry in the evening. The bandicoots were all gone. One morning, they heard a strange noise. They saw a dark animal in the misty light. Thinking it was a bandicoot, the sons attacked it. But but, but, the animal screamed, I am not a bandicoot, I am a man just like you, and now you have made me lame. <laughs> <laughs> this was the birth of the first kangaroo, which in Aboriginal is called Tenjenterama. That evening, Carola's sons gathered around the kangaroo. You remember the flood stories last week? Here we have a flood, but not water. Honey, spurting from either the pole or waterfall, engulfing the whole land of Ilpatlinja <coughs> and drowning Carora's sons. But Carora remained by his pole, and he went back to sleep, and he dreamt again, and what did he dream? Another generation of Arborigines. Dreaming is very important. If one person dreams alone, it remains only a dream. If many people, or only two people, live and dream the same dream, the dream can become reality. It's not <coughs> a dream, it's from Untertwasser. And here is a dream <coughs> painting of Karora, the first man creator of everything, Bendikut and Kangaroo. Now we're going to leave Australia and we're going to go to Mongolia. Mongolia with the Kobe Desert. Ready? Yes. Stunning, isn't it? <laughs> You find those colors are not photoshopped, then. Eh? It's all the rocks and the minerals under. And I've seen that 
in the uh, Seychelles. Very weird, huh? I've never been to Mongolia, but I've seen those colors, and it's called Chamarel in the Seychelles, and in Mauritius as well. It's weird, isn't it? Here they are. Look at those. Mm. Now, because there is no grass at all, no nothing, when a Mongolian dies, they leave the body on the rock, and they dance, they chant, uh, and the vulture comes to eat, to pick, until there's only the bone left. We made, oh, this is cruel, this is, no, it's not cruel. This is the way, when you have no grass, when you can't bury, that this is it. Mongolian shaman, and those are Mongolian wrathful, protector Buddhist masks because in Mongolia they have very inspired influence by Tibetan Buddhism. There is a variety of accounts from Mongol tribes of Central Asia, yet a general outline can be made. The creation of the world is attributed to a lama, not the uh, animal. The lama is a Buddhist Mongolian <laughs> abbot and his name was Udan. This Lama creator is sometimes conflated with Buddha Sakyamuni by the tribes influenced by Tibetan Buddhism. The Mongol primordial world is usually described as being covered again in darkness, with no separation between earth and sky. One account of the construction of the cosmos describes 99 golden columns holding apart the sky and the earth. And the world has three levels. <coughs> the upper level, the heaven where God and goddesses live. The middle level, being earth where man, humankind, dwells. And the lower one, being the place where humans go after death. Sky, heaven is the father, and earth is the mother of man, animals, and all vegetation. In some accounts, the world first was a vast, vast ocean, and dust and sand rose to cover the ocean surface, and that's how it became Earth. In another account, the land is placed on the back of a golden frog, who was pierced with arrows, causing fire and water to spew at various places. And that's how they make a camp of the hot springs and volcanoes in the Mongolian country. In all accounts, after the creation of the earth itself, the first male and female couple was created ah, out of clay. And they would become the progenitors of all humanity. About the sun, in the beginning, there were seven suns in the sky, so that the rivers and vegetation on Earth, they dried up. So the people asked the archer, Erkei Merget, to shoot the suns out of the sky. The archer shot down six suns. But while he was taking aim at the seventh, a martin flew in front of the sun and was shot in the tail. From then on, the martin has a forked tail, and there is a single sun remaining in the sky. The archer was so distressed that he fled to the step, and he cut off his thumb in shame, and became the ancestor of the marmot, who was only four little pebbles. You see, you're surrounded by things you don't know what they are, and you find with imagination and spirit a way to explain. We need to put meaning in the things that otherwise would have no meaning. Those stories are magnificent. So marmot is actually the chicken of the Mongol people. And here is barbecue marmot called korhogok or budok. Following the same recipe from the times of the nomadic Mongols of Genghis Khan, except for the torch. <laughs> now, we're gonna go to North America, and meet the Navajo. <clears throat> the Navajo creation story is nurtured by the love of their land and nature. It involves four worlds. 
In the first world, first man and first woman come into being. In the second world, very similar to that of the Garden of Eden story in Genesis, it ends with first man and first woman banished to the third world. In the third world, they begin to procreate. In the fourth world, they settle down with the help of the wind god. The wind scattering the seeds, you see. The Navajo people's beliefs are called the Dine Bahane. The stars of the Pleiade are a microcosmic symbol of the orderly universe. Several hundred young stars that are over 400 light years away. And the Dine people of the Navajo call them Diliehe, or sparkling particles. The Dine are the people of the Navajo nation. Just to remember, during Second World War, that the Navajo people gave the language as a code to save us. What's up to the Navajo today? The sacred land is being fracked. Their ancestors' sacred cemetery is about to be ransacked. Thank you very much. I won't go any further. I don't want to go political. Dine, the Navajo people, that cosmology is an understanding of a natural balance between order and chaos. Magnificent. Magnificent. The universe is the mass of black gold. The Pleiad are associated with black god, who represents a group of powerful demigods collectively called Hash Heishichimi. Father by fire and suckled by a comet, black god is the personification of fire. Black god figures prominently as one of the original six gods of the running pitch place. The first of four worlds from which the Dine eventually emerged. Black God carries a fire drill and a shredded bark, all from a cedar tree which has been hit by lightning, from which he can make many fires. He is recognized <coughs> by a buck skin mask that is blackened by sacred charcoal, save for several white markings. A sketch of the face of Black God depicts as a sky map with a crescent moon on his forehead, the sun as his nose, and the Pleiad on his left temple. The Navajo Milky Way, Black God was carefully ordering the stars in the sky, but impatient coyote blew the remaining stars from Black God's pouch forming the Milky Way. <laughs> this story explains why some stars are dimmer than others, because Black God did not like the ones Coyote blew in the sky. Make sense? <laughs> the Navajo Powo, or Powwow. The term Powwow is the white man's version of the Indian word Powo which originally stood for a healing ceremony conducted by the spiritual or religious leaders of various tribes. When the white men started settling around Native American lands, they witnessed these powwow or powwow, and soon the powwow term referred to any type of Indian gathering, regardless of its purpose, regardless of its spiritual dimension. Navajo spirituality is all about interpersonal relations in a universal equilibrium. Illness is considered being out of harmony with the world. Sick is being out of balance. That explains a lot of things today, doesn't it? Eh? No? Hmm? Therefore, when someone is sick, a medicine man leads a night way or night chant, the most sacred Navajo ceremony. And those are sand paintings of the night way and the night chants. Let's go in the first world. Four corners, four clouds, 
containing within themselves all the elements of this false world. And they were in color black, white, blue, yellow. The first world is called Niho di Hill, the black world. The Navajo origin stories begin with the first world of darkness known as Niho di Hill. And from this dark world, the Dine began a journey of emergence into the world of the present. The first world was ruled by four seas, the frog, west sea, the blue heron, south sea, the white thunder, north sea, and the big water creature, east sea. The white and black clouds came together and created first men called Atsehastin. The blue and yellow clouds created first woman, Atse Estran. The second world is called Niho Dutsli. There, help me here. Ni ho du is the blue world. Because of the strife in the first world, first man and first woman, and the coyote was also called first angry, followed by all the others, climbed up to the world of darkness and dampness to the second world or blue world. In this blue world, insects, wildcats, mountain lions, birds, wolves, foxes, many beings lived in the blue world and sacred tobacco too. Four animals found an opening into the world of blue haze. They climbed through it and led the people up into the third or yellow world called Nihatso, the yellow world. It contained four gods and five sets of twins born in four day increments. Each set of twins is given to one of the gods to become the ancestors of the four Nafaro clans. This recurrence of the number four, you have the four sacred mountains of the Navajo people linked to the four directions, east, west, north, south, and the four elements, air, water, earth, fire. Nothing to do with number four in China, which is a death. That's why you never have a number four in any of the elevators. The yellow world was large. A great river crossed its land from north to south, and it was the female river. And there was another river crossing it from east to west. It was the male river. And this male river flowed through the female river. Now, isn't that beautiful? The third world saw the discovery of the gods, the creation of some more people, the teaching of weaving, the gender schism, schism, and another great flood. The Navajo Great Flood Story. One day, Coyote took Water Monster baby. Water Monster was very angry. He was so angry that he decided to make it rain. And it rained and rained. The water was higher and higher. Then the water began to flood. <coughs> the beings didn't know where to go to escape the flood. First man tried to help them, told them to come up to Blanco Peak East Mountain. But the water kept rising, and it was higher than the mountains. This is Blanco Peak. I went to Colorado, so it's, it's, it's magic. It's, it, I mean, really, go alone, not with the tourist. Uh, 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 mm. First man wondered what to do. So he planted a cedar tree, but it did not grow higher than the water. Then he planted a pine tree, but the pine tree was too short. Then he planted a male reed, but the reed was still too short. Oh my god. Oh, dear, dear, dear. dear. Finally, First man planted a female reed, and this reed grew to the sky. The beings climbed up onto the female reed. Then they got up to the top, and they found another world, and it was the fourth world, the white world. Not because of white people, because all beings were living there today, the humans were created after the third world, and we're mixing up the fourth world. Here we are, Ni Halgan. Why was it called the fourth world, the white world? Because it was glittering. And the locust was the first to reach the fourth world. Locust 
looked around and saw that the world was covered with glittering water and everything looked white. This is why they call it the glittering world or the white world. The other beings followed locusts and everyone came into the white world and the place where they came is called Hajime. <clears throat> Many people say this place is somewhere in the Plata Mountains in Colorado. Another beautiful story. Let's go to the Lakota. All those lands taken away from them. Sitting Bull, a Lakota holy man who led his people during years of resistance against the United States government policies. I have another lecture just on there where the braids are cut to take away their strength. Early on, they were put in uh, reservations, in camps. Today, the young Lakota in Pine Ridge Reservation makes you cry. Lakota creation myth. There was another world before this one. But the people of that world did not behave themselves at all. This pleased the creating power again linked to monotheism, set out to make a new world. And the Cretan power sang several songs to bring rain, which poured stronger with each song. As the Cretan power sang the fourth song, the earth split apart, and water gushed up through the many cracks, causing the flood. By the time the rain stopped, all of the people and nearly all of the animals had drowned. But Kangi the crow survived. Kangi pleaded with the creating power to make him a new place to rest. So the creating power decided the time had come to make this new world. And from his huge pipe bag, which contained all types of animals and birds, the creating power created selected four animals known for their ability to remain underwater for a long time. The creating power sent each in turn to retrieve a lump of mud from beneath the flood waters. First he sent the loon, because he dove deep into the dark waters, but he was not able to reach the bottom. Then he sent the otter, who, even with his strong wet feet, also fell. Third, he sent the beaver, who used his large flat tail to propel itself deep under the water. But it too broke nothing back. Finally, the creating power took the turtle from his pipe and urged it to bring back some mud. And this is what turtle did. Turtle stayed under the water for so long that everyone was sure it had drowned. Then, with a splash, the turtle broke the water surface and mud filled its feet and claws and the cracks between its upper and lower shells. Singing, the creating power shaped the mud in his hands and spread it on the water where it was just big enough for himself and the crow. He then shook two long eagle wing feathers over the mud until earth spread wide and varied, overcoming the waters. Feeling sadness for the dry land, the creating power cried tears that became oceans, streams, and lakes. And he named the new land Turtle Continent in honor of the turtle who provided the mud from which it was formed. The creating power then took many animals and birds from his great pipe bag and spread them across the earth. A pipe bag, or sacred tobacco bag, symbolizes spiritual and physical transformation from red, white, black, and yellow earth that could explain the different color scheme. Mm -hmm. The creating power made men and women and gave the people his sacred pipe and told them to live by it. We have the Torah, other people have got the Popol Vuh, for them it's a sacred pipe. The creating power warned them about the fate of the people who came before them and promised all, promised all would be well if all living things learn to live in harmony. 
oh dear. <laughs> the creating power also promised that the world would be destroyed in the game if they made it bad and ugly. The Mayan creation myth, the oldest written myth date from the 16th century and are found in historical sources from the Guatemalan Highlands. The most important of these documents is the Popol Vuh, or Book of the Council. Popol Vuh, in the Che language, is a story of creation according to the Maya. At the beginning of the world, there were only two creator gods, Tepeu the Maker and Gukumats the Feathered Spirit. Here is Tepeu the Maker and Gukumats. Whatever they thought, came to be. They thought Earth and the Earth was created out of the primordial sea. Once the Earth was created, Tepe and Gukumas populated it with animals. But they soon realized that animals were unable to speak and so could not worship them. Mm -hmm. ah. mm -hmm. For this reason, humans were created to worship the gods and the animals were relegated to feed the humans. This generation of humans was made out of mud. They were weak and soon destroyed. The gods then created men from wood and women from rushes. These humans populated the world, but they soon forgot their gods. And they were punished with a flood. The few who survived were transformed into monkeys. And this is why monkeys look like humans. <laughs> they are what is left of what came before, an experiment in human design. Finally, the gods decided to mold humankind from maize. They were the true people. This generation of maize people, which includes the present human race, was able to worship and nourish the gods. Here is Saint Theotol, the corn god. The maize people, not such an impossible creation myth, as in essence, it was the cultivation of maize that gave the early Maya culture the means to change from hunter-gatherers to their highly advanced civilization. Mexico was, uh, 30, 40 years ago, number one in the world for biodiversity. They had 500 species of maize, more than hundreds and hundreds of species of potato. And now, if you find five corns, three potatoes, well. The two creator gods are also called part of sky. You have Kukulkan the maker and Hurricane the modeler. Part of sky thinks of Earth and Earth is created. He thinks of mountains and great mountains come. Heart of Kai, Sky thinks of trees and trees grow on the land. Heart of Sky plans, thinks the creature of the forest, the bird, the deer, the jaguar, the snakes, and each is given his home. You, the deer, sleep here along the rivers. You, the birds, the nest are in the trees. Multiply and scatter. Thought creation, the brain create reality. You think your reality. With the Maori creation myth, Hongi and the breath of life. New Zealand, the home of the Maori. Yo is the supreme being, ex nihilo, out of nothing, creator of the entire universe. He creates Rangwini, also called Rangi, the sky father, and Papatwanuku, or Papa, the Earth Mother. Rangi and Papa are the primordial couple. Rangi and Papa are the primordial parents, the Sky Father, the Earth Mother, who lie locked together in a tight embrace. They have many children, all of whom are male, and who are forced to live in the cramped darkness between their parents. And these children grow, and they discuss among themselves what it would be like to live in the light. Tuma Tauwenga, the fierce 
incest of the children proposes that the best solution to their predicament is to kill the parents. <laughs> Here is a representation of Tuma, Saul, and Gab. But his brother, Tane, disagrees, suggesting that it is better to push them apart, to let Rangi in the sky above, while Papa would remain below to nurture them. Bongo, the god of cultivated food, also tries to push his parents apart. Then Tengaroa, the god of the sea, and his sibling, Haumiatitekiki, Teketitikitike, the god of wild food, in spite of their joints and bottom, Randy and Papa remain close together in their loving embrace. Tane, god of forests and birds, is going to be the one who can force his parents apart. But instead of standing upright, pushing with his hands and his brothers before the dawn, he lies on his back and he pushes, pushes, pushes with his strong legs until with cries of grief and surprise, Randy and Papa were pried apart. Kauri Matea, the god of storms and winds, is angered that the parents have been torn apart. He cannot bear to hear the cries of his parents, nor see Randy's tears has torn apart from Papa. Kauri Matea promises his siblings that from henceforth they will have to deal with his anger. Kauri Matea flies off to join Randy up in the sky and there carefully fosters his own many offspring who include the winds, one of whom is sent to each quarter of the compass. To fight his brothers, Tawiri Matea gathers an army of his children, winds and clouds, fierce squalls, whirlwinds, gloomy thick clouds, fiery clouds, hurricane clouds, thunderstorm clouds, rain, mists, fog. And today, when mist rises from the forest, they are called Papa's sighs. The warmth of Papa's body yearns for rain, and it is this yearning for warmth which nurtures mankind. Now we're going to go to the Norse creation myth <coughs> from a land of ice. Norse's countries, Denmark, Greenland, Faroe Islands, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, very linked to the Vikings. Adatma is an altogether different story. Bear with me. Before time existed, there was a place of fog and ice called Nifhal. <coughs> and across a great void, a place of fire, Mustelhal, where fire demons and fire giants dwell. Fire from Muspelheim eventually melted Nifheim ice. And sure enough, we have found today 91 volcanoes in Antarctica. And they are erupting under the ice. Now you can imagine when all the volcanoes of Antarctica are going to erupt, it's going to be another nice flood. The melted ice dripped and formed Autumla, the giant cow, and the frost giant called Emir. Autumna the cow licked the salty ice and created the first half man half god called Buri. Buri got married to Vesna, and they have three sons, half gods and half giant Odin, Vili, and Ve. The drops of melting ice had formed in him, fire and ice, and the hermaphrodite, primordial, evil, godlike Norse giant who reproduced himself into more giants through his sweat, Emil, fire and ice. Odin and his brothers slew Emil and constructed the world from his corpse. Life comes from death. Odin, Vili, and Ve fashioned the oceans from his blood, the soil from his skin and muscles, vegetation from his hair, clouds from his brains, and the sky from his skull. There were four dwarves corresponding to the four cardinal points, which were holding Emir's skull above the earth. 
The gods eventually formed first man and forced woman, Ask and Embla, the Norse version of Adam and Eve, from two tree trunks. To protect them from the giant, the gods built the fence around their home, the magical realm of Mika. Now we go to the Dao Panku creation myth, which is part of the Buddhist Chinese with the universal egg and the yin yang. The shape of the primal mass was called chaos. And it was something like an egg. And for 18,000 years, the universe remained in this state until the incubation was finally complete and the egg hatched. Panku the giant is said to have come forth from chaos the egg with two horns, two tusks, and a hairy body. Panku the giant lived for 18,000 years with the assistance of four creatures, a tortoise, a phoenix, a dragon, and a unicorn. And he labored daily to mold the earth. Panku separated heaven from earth setting the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets in place, and dividing the four seas. He shaped the earth by chiseling out valleys and stacking up mountains. All this was accomplished from Panku's knowledge of yin yang, the inescapable principle of duality in all things. Now, Panku, my yang, Aquí está el mal, so you have the evil in the black. Aquí está el bien, the good in the white. And then in the good, there is always a little bit of bad, and in the bad, there is always a little bit of good. Aquí está la vida, so is life. <laughs> Panku's eyes became the sun and the moon. His blood and sweat became the rivers. His hair grew into trees and plants, and his body became the soul. And the human race, <laughs> well, <laughs> we evolved from parasites <laughs> that infested Panku's body. Yeah. Hawaii creation myth from the sacred text, the Kumu Leo. Hawaii, 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 Hawaii. Mm -hmm. The sea, the jungle, mountains, cascades, and of course, lava okay. erupting volcanoes. The power flower. In the midst of Po, the endless black chaos, there was a great void. It was a time of deep darkness before the memory of humankind. Into this void came Kame, the god of creation, who created light to push back Po. Kane picked up a giant calabash, which is the calabasi, the zucchini, but squash, threw it high into the air, where it broke in two enormous pieces. The top piece was curved like a ball and became the sky. The ski seeds scattered and became the stars. And the remainder of the calabash fell down and became the earth. And here's a calabash carrier photo of 1920. Mm -hmm. There were three other deities, Kanaloa, the god of sea, Ku, the god of war, and Lono, the god of agriculture and peace. Ku and Lono can be seen as Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Kanaloa, Kane, Ku, Lono. And of course, Pele, the goddess of volcanoes and fires, the creator of the Hawaiian Islands. Pele lives in Haemaumau crater called Kilauea. Pele's hair, this is how they explain the volcanic glass in strands. And of course, a tree is named after her, the Pele tree. We can see some of those here because the blooming flowers look like fire. The sky domain was Rangi, and earth was Papa. Wow, same names as in the Maori, mm -hmm. and of course, the Maori of New Zealand, 
and Bidin, they were all from the Polynesian. They traveled by sea. And they carried with us some of the culture where they were, and then it transformed and evolved. But Papa and Rangi, the same as the Maori. To Kananoa, Kane gave the care of the sea that surrounded them. Then Kane proclaimed that he was going to create a great chief to rule over all the earth and to prepare for the needs of his great chief. Kane first filled the earth with living things caterpillars to make moths and butterflies. Kane created eggs which would hatch into birds of every sort, both land birds and sea birds. Then he created geckos, salamanders, and turtles for both land and sea. Kane gave Ku the domain of forest to grow great koa trees used in the ebenistry work. He also created the candlenut tree, the how tree, and the willy willy tree. And to Lono, Kane gave the domain of food plants to feed the great chief. Breadfruit, sweet potato we know, coconut we know, and taro. A kind, this is how it grows in the plantation of taro, which is a kind of uh, like a hikama or a radish. Kane was satisfied and told the gods they must now seek out the material required to construct this great chief, be it wood or clay, stone or bark. Kane sent them far and wide, and the gods searched and searched when one day they found a great mound of rich red earth overlooking the sea. They took some of this red earth to Kane, who fashioned a figure of man breathing life into it. The clay breathing again, like last week. Soon, the man walked about and spoke to the gods. And the gods were pleased. They called him Red Earth Man. You remember last week? Adam, Adama, Earth, Dam, Blood, Red. And proclaimed him the first son of Randy Sky and Papa Earth. From this union also came Wakia and his wife, Lihaula, from whom are descended the priest, the Kahuna, nothing to do with the Kohanes here, attention, and other chiefs, Ali. All Hawaiian chiefs descend from this first union of rank in the sky and Papa the earth. And now we say goodbye. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs>